Hi everyone, and welcome back to Educator.com. This lesson is going to be about friction. Now, our objectives are going to be to define and identify frictional forces, yay friction, explain the factors that determine the amount of friction between two surfaces, and determine the frictional force and coefficient of friction between two surfaces. So let's dive in. Friction is a force that opposes motion. Kinetic friction is a type of friction that opposes motion for an object that is sliding along another surface. Kinetic friction is sliding friction. Static friction acts on an object that isn't sliding. Now the magnitude of the frictional force is determined by two things. The nature of the surface is in contact, and we characterize that with mu, uh, a variable that refers to the coefficient of friction. Bigger coefficients of friction, bigger mu, so you're going to have more friction between the two surfaces. Imagine something like, oh, let's say really flat dress shoes on ice, very slippery, compared to two pieces of sandpaper. The sandpaper is going to have a much higher coefficient of friction. And the normal force acting on the object is the other item that determines the magnitude of the frictional force. Now, as we talk about these types of friction and the magnitudes of these frictional forces, it's important to note that typically kinetic friction is less than static friction. And you've probably observed that before. Ever tried to push something really heavy along the, uh, along the floor? maybe pushing a sofa or a refrigerator or something heavy, it takes a lot of work to get it started because you've got to overcome static friction. Once you've got it moving, however, now you're into the regime of kinetic friction. It usually takes a little bit less force. Kinetic friction usually smaller than static friction. Now, as we talk about these coefficients of friction, we're going to have a different coefficient depending on whether it's sliding or static then. So the coefficient of friction mu, we're going to talk about the coefficient of kinetic friction, mu k, or the coefficient of static friction, mu s. So this coefficient of friction is really the ratio of the frictional force and the normal force. So coefficient of friction given by the force of friction divided by the normal force. And it depends only on the nature of the surfaces that are in contact. You can look up in many different places approximate coefficients of friction. And you can see, as we have on the uh, slide here, that there are different values for kinetic or static. Rubber on dry concrete has a kinetic coefficient of 0.68. But on static, when it's not sliding, it's 0.9. That means that if you lock your wheels as you're driving down the road on a con dry concrete, if they're sliding, if they're skidding, you have less friction than if they're not sliding. This is the reason for anti-lock brakes in cars. If you're sliding, you're not getting as much stopping force as you would if you weren't sliding. So they try and keep cars from sliding with these anti-lock brakes, not allowing them to slide. And you could look up the coefficient of friction for many different materials. So let's take a look at some examples and try and determine which regime of friction they're in, kinetic or static. If we have a sled sliding down, and sliding down a snowy hill, sliding, there's our key word, that must be kinetic friction. We would use the kinetic coefficient. A refrigerator at rest that you want to move, at rest implies not sliding. That one's static. A car with the tires rolling freely. Well, we just talked about that. Not skidding, therefore static. If you're skidding across pavement, though, you're going to use kinetic coefficient of friction. Let's take an example here. A car's performance is tested on various horizontal road surfaces. The brakes are applied, causing the rubber tires of the car to slide along the road, the road without rolling. They are sliding. They encounter the greatest force of friction to stop the car on which of these surfaces? Dry concrete, dry asphalt, wet concrete, or wet asphalt? Well, first thing we need to realize is if we're sliding, we are looking for the kinetic coefficient. Which one of these is the biggest? Rubber on concrete, dry, wet, or rubber on asphalt, dry and wet? 0.68 is our biggest coefficient, so that will have the greatest force of 
friction, dry concrete. Another example, we've got a block on an incline. The diagram shows the block sliding down a plane, inclined at angle theta, there's theta, as angle theta is increased, as that gets steeper, what happens to the coefficient of kinetic friction between the bottom surface of the block and the surface of the incline? Well, here you have to remember that the coefficient of friction depends on the nature of the surfaces. In this case, the surfaces haven't changed. Yes, you're going to have some other different effects, but as far as the coefficient of friction goes, the nature of the surfaces hasn't changed. Therefore, the coefficient of friction will remain the same. To calculate the force of friction, again, it depends only upon the nature of the surfaces in contact, that coefficient of friction, and the magnitude of the normal force. And we've got a nice direct relationship. Force of friction equals the coefficient of friction mu times the normal force. We can combine this with Newton's second law in free body diagrams to solve even more involved problems than we did in our Newton's second law discussion. While we're here and talking about friction, let's come back to terminal velocity. Objects falling through Earth's atmosphere experience a force of friction that we call air resistance. That's a drag force, and as the object goes faster, there's even more of that. Eventually, an object gets going fast enough that the force of friction balances the force of gravity on the object. When that happens, you reach what's known as terminal velocity. The net force is zero. You don't gain any more speed the longer you fall. So a graph of velocity versus time for an object that we're now taking into account air resistance, it's going to start when it, say we throw somebody out of an airplane. Their vertical velocity, not that we would ever do that, their vertical velocity starts at zero and it increases, increases, increases. That force of friction, that force of air resistance, the faster they go, gets greater and greater until eventually they hit this asymptote, which we know as the terminal velocity. When they do that, at that point where they hit terminal velocity, free body diagram, the weight of the object and the force of air resistance exactly balance. No net force, no acceleration, constant velocity. Let's take a look at another example. Finding the frictional force. In the diagram, we have a four kilogram object accelerating at 10 meters per second squared on a rough horizontal surface. Find the magnitude of the frictional force, FF, acting on the object. Well, let's start with our free body diagram. We have the normal force, the object's weight. We have this applied force to the right of 50 newtons. And we have a frictional force to the left. And all of my forces line up with the axes, so I don't need to go draw a pseudo free body diagram. Since we're looking for the magnitude of the frictional force, I'm going to start by writing Newton's second law for the x direction. And I'm going to replace now net force in the x direction with all the forces acting in the x direction. I look at my free body diagram, I've got 50 newtons to the right, the applied force, minus force of friction, and that must equal my mass, 4 kilograms, times my acceleration, 10 meters per second squared. Or, 50 newtons minus force of friction equals 40 kilogram meters per second squared, which is a newton. Therefore, force of friction must be equal to 10 newtons. Let's take a look at another example. Here we have a box on a wood surface. A horizontal force of 8 newtons is used to pull a 20 newton wooden box moving toward the right along a horizontal wood surface where we know that the coefficient of kinetic friction there is 0 0.3. We're asked to find the frictional force acting on the box, the net force acting on the box, the mass of the box, and the acceleration of the box. Well, we'll start with our free body diagram. We have normal force. We have its weight, mg, which it tells us it's a 20 newton wooden box, so that must be 20. We have a force to the right, an applied force of 8 newtons, and we must have some frictional force 
to the left. If we want to find the frictional force acting on the box, what I'm going to write is the force of friction equals mu times the normal force. And oh, by the way, look, friction is F-U-N. Friction's fun. Mu is 0 0.3. And our normal force, in this case, if you look in the y direction, that must be equal to mg. There is no net force in the y direction. Otherwise, that box would spontaneously take up off the table or go through it. And we know that doesn't happen. They have to be balanced. So the normal force here must be 20 newtons. So 0 0.3 times 20, or 6 newtons. Also asks for the net force acting on the box. Net force in the x direction is just going to be 8 newtons to the right minus 6 newtons to the left, our frictional force, or 2 newtons. How about the mass of the box? Well, we know its weight, mg, is 20 newtons. So if we just divide both sides by g, we should get the mass, which is going to be 20 newtons divided by g, 10, is going to be 2 kilograms. And finally, the acceleration of the box. Well, acceleration is net force divided by mass. We just determined the net force here was 2 newtons. We determined the mass was 2 kilograms. So the acceleration must be 1 meter per second squared. Let's take a look at an example where we explore the difference between static and kinetic friction. Compared to the force needed to start sliding a crate across a rough level floor, the force needed to keep it sliding once it's moving is, well, needed to start, you need to overcome static friction. Once it's sliding, it's kinetic. Kinetic is less than static. Therefore, it's going to be less. Let's take a look at a drag force. An airplane is moving with a constant velocity in level flight. All right, we've got an airplane moving with constant velocity in level flight. Compare the magnitude of the forward force provided by the engines, typically call that thrust, to the backward frictional drag force. Well, let's draw our free body diagram. There's our airplane. We have some thrust forward. We have a drag force backwards. Force that's pulling it up, we call lift. And we have its weight. Now, if it's moving at constant velocity in level flight, everything must balance out. They must be equal. So the force of the thrust, the force of the engines, must balance the force of the drag. Therefore, they must be equal. Another example. Have Susie over here pulling a sled. She pulls the handle of a 20 kilogram sled across the yard with a force of 100 newtons. And that's at an angle of 30 degrees. The yard exerts a force of 25 newtons on the sled due to friction. We're asked to find the coefficient of friction between the sled and the yard and determine the distance the sled travels if it starts from rest and Susie maintains her 100 newton force for five seconds. Well, let's start off with a free body diagram. Y, X. There's our sled. We have weight down, force of friction to the left, 25 newtons. We have the normal force from the ground up. And we have the applied force of Susie, which is 100 newtons at an angle of 30 degrees. So my pseudo free body diagram, I'll draw that down here. Right away, let's put in our red vectors, the ones that already line up with the axes. We have mg, force of friction, and normal force. Now, we've got to break that up into components. So the x component of Susie's applied force is going to be 100 newtons cosine 30. 100 newtons cosine 30 degrees. And the y component, 100 newtons sine 30 degrees. 
Now we can go start to solve our questions. Find the coefficient of friction between the sled and the yard. Well, I'm going to start by writing Newton's second law, and I'm going to look in the y direction, equals may. And I'm going to replace the net force in the y direction with all the different things I see here. I've got 100 sine 30, that's going to be 50, plus the normal force, Fn, minus mg, and I know common sense tells me that sled isn't going to go spontaneously accelerating up off the ground, so that must all equal zero. Acceleration in the y is zero. So I can solve for the normal force. The normal force then must be mg minus 50, which is going to be mass 20 kilograms times 10 minus 50, or 150 newtons. Mu, then, the coefficient of friction, is the force of friction divided by the normal force, which is 25 over 150, or 0 0.167. There's our coefficient of friction. Now then, it also tells us to determine the distance the sled travels if it starts from rest and Susie maintains her 100 Newton force for 5 seconds. Well, to do that, it'd be nice to know the acceleration of the sled in the x direction. Let's go to Newton's second law in the x direction. F net x is going to be 86.6 Newtons, 100 cosine 30, minus the force of friction, 25 Newtons, or 61.6 Newtons. Therefore, acceleration, which is that net force divided by the mass, is 61.6 newtons over 20 kilograms. It's going to accelerate at about 3.1 meters per second squared. So if we want to find out how far it goes in that five second interval, we can go back to our kinematics. Delta x equals the initial t plus one half a t squared. And v initial here, if it starts from rest, is zero, so that's just going to be one half times our a, 3.1 meters per second squared, times the square of our time, five seconds squared, or 38.8 meters. Hopefully that gives you a good start with friction, the coefficient of friction. Thanks for watching educator.com. Make it a great day.